All right, so now that we have kind of learned how to deal with autonomous differential equations, we can arrive at kind of the final topic of this course, and one of my favorite topics is systems of autonomous differential equations, right? So systems of, or in what we'll be dealing with is coupled autonomous differential equations, uh, since we're only gonna think about uh, sets of two. Right? So systems of two. Of course, you can have a system of any number of differential equations you want or need to model whatever problem you're interested in. Uh, but here we'll learn some techniques for dealing with uh, coupled pairs of autonomous differential equations. So what do we mean by that? I mean, a lot of these systems we've been modeling, like let's say, you know, population growth, right? These bacterial population models, we'd say, okay, we have some population X. Its rate of change is maybe... Uh, proportional to its current population level, okay? And then it just grows in a vacuum, absent of any interaction with any other thing in its environment, okay? But let's say that we're interested in uh, population bacteria that's preyed on by some type of amoeba, right? Then its growth rate would, uh, you know, its rate of change over time would be this natural population growth rate minus a predation term, right? So minus... We'll call it b x y where b is going to be kind of the predation rate and x is its own uh you know population level and y is the uh predator population level right and this is kind of based on a very simple assumption that says that uh you know the more bacteria will get eaten the more uh, predators there are right so an amoeba will encounter a, pred a predator and get eaten at a rate b okay so you need kind of an x and a y to interact at some rate b to get kind of a decrease in your population level okay so then then over here this would be a would be our natural growth rate okay so it wants to grow exponentially uh with growth rate a right but then it's being eaten by these predators y at a rate b okay so then the other thing we want to know is okay well how is y changing right so a and b will be you know parameters but y is going to be its own variable that can change over time right so these will be our prey and then our predators we'll call them y right we want to track their uh growth rate or decay over time right so the change in the predator population while well, they're eating these prey at the rate B, well, let's say that, you know, not every successful meal results in uh, increase in that population, right? So, you know, they have to eat to survive, but maybe, uh, you know, it takes them longer to reproduce or, or whatever. Um, so it maybe has its own growth rate, C, but is dependent on that kind of predation term. So let's say C, X, Y will be its increase from predation. And then absent of eating prey, maybe it has kind of a natural death rate, D, Y, right? So instead of growing, right? So this thing has to prey on uh, the prey in order to grow. Otherwise, it, it just kind of dies off, right? So if there's no prey, then this thing has nothing to eat, right? These amoebas have nothing to eat, and so they'll die off at this rate here. Okay, so here we'll have our predation, uh, you know, growth from predation versus you know natural death rate okay because they're not eating enough okay so then you're going to get these two coupled autonomous differential equations because time doesn't appear right these are autonomous because t right there's no t on the right hand side no time on the right hand sides okay and it's a coupled pair of equations because x growth rate depends on y y's growth rate depends on x okay so coupled since x depends on y x and y and so does dy dt They both depend on each other, okay? And so the general kind of autonomous coupled differential equation 
would look like dx dt is some function of x and y. dy dt is a different function, maybe we'll call it g, of x and y, right? So this is a coupled autonomous system. Coupled autonomous DEs, differential equations. Okay, and so these can come, you know, from, from pretty much anywhere in biology. You can find uh, a nice coupled system of, that maybe describes some simple aspects of that system. Okay, so we can think about this coming from, uh, you know, an epidemic model, right? So the SIR model, which I think we talked about briefly um, in one of our problem solving sessions where you have a population of infected individuals and a population of susceptible individuals, right? So here we have infected, here we have susceptibles. Um, and typically there's also a, a different compartment for recovered people, but we're just not gonna include that in this two-dimensional model, okay? But you basically have an infection rate where a susceptible person becomes infected with this disease at a rate, uh, I guess we're calling it alpha here, right? So this is rate infected at a rate that depends on uh, both the number of susceptible people and the number of infected people, right? So alpha SI, right? Because you need, kind of like a predation term, right? You need an interaction between a susceptible person and an infected person, and they'll kind of catch it or become infected at this rate, alpha. So then the total number of new infections is alpha SI, okay? And then in the SIR model, you know, these infecteds will then recover. So they would go to this recover category, but we just won't include it for this two-dimensional model. And they'll recover at a rate, let's call it mu times I, right? Some recovery rate mu times the number of infected people will tell us how many people uh, recover from this disease. Okay, so then the model, and we write it down in kind of differential equation format, right, is we kind of write down these different rates. So the change of infections, right, there's new infections at a rate plus alpha SI, and then recovery, so they leave this category at a rate minus mu I. And the susceptibles, DSDT are just going to decrease at a rate alpha SI as they catch the disease, okay? So then this is a nice coupled system, coupled Ds, right? And they are, no time appears on the right-hand side here, so they are autonomous, okay? And so each of these examples we'll go into in more detail uh, once we've kind of learned how to analyze these types of equations. I just want to kind of give an overview of where where these different types of equations come from and the kind of complex systems that they can model, right? So this can model epidemics and it's kind of the, uh, they don't use this necessarily to predict all epidemics, but this really simple model, but it's kind of the, the, the kind of framework of a lot of epidemic modeling is this kind of set of, you know, compartments and thinking about these in, in more complicated ways with more sophisticated, you know, infection rates and whatnot. But, but this is kind of the basic uh, framework that they, that they start with. Okay, another problem comes from Newton's law of cooling, right? So when we did this in the one-dimensional case, we said we had an object, right, with temperature H, and it's sitting in a room at temperature A, right, and it has a cooling constant alpha, right? And we said that the room was so big or, you know, it, it couldn't really be affected by the temperature of the object it's heating up or cooling, but the object is gonna try to equilibrate to this temperature, right? So we said in the one dimensional case, the room temperature is constant, right? It's not affected by this object that we're heating. But, you know, if the room is small enough and the object is hot or big enough or cold enough or what have you, right? it could potentially change the temperature of the room, right? So in the 2D case, we'll track changes in the room temperature as well. Okay, 
So then in that case, the system becomes dh dt, right, is alpha a minus h. So this is exactly Newton's law of cooling, where we have the room, pen, room temperature cooling constant for our object, and then the temperature of our object, right? So this is object cooling constant versus object temperature. And then in red, I'll have the room temp. Okay, so in the 1D case, this was just a constant, but in this two-dimensional case, we're thinking about, well, maybe the temperature of the room is affected by the temperature of our object, right? So then in that case, we'll need to track the rate of change of the room temperature, and it's gonna have its own cooling constant. And Newton's law of cooling says it's gonna be proportional to the temperature difference between the room and the thing it's interacting with, which in this case is the other object. So here we get an H minus A, since it's the kind of opposite temperature difference. Okay, and so here in red, I'll have the cooling constant of the room, right? So depending on you know, the properties of the room, uh, you know, it could, you know, for, for kind of the case we were thinking about before, this cooling constant was uh, really, I want to say really big. Um, but I, I won't say that, but uh, I guess basically in, in the one dimensional case, this, this alpha is basically zero, right? So it's not affected, right? In that case, you have DADT equals zero, right? The room temperature is constant. So here we're allowing this to have its own cooling constant, which is not zero, so that this is going to change at some other rate, right? So if we wanted to track kind of the equilibrium temperature here, right? Equilibrium temperature might be different than in the one case, one dimensional case. Might be different than 1D case, right? It might still be, I mean, it still will be that the temperatures will be equal, but whether or not they will be equal to that kind of constant A value that we had before is kind of up for debate. Or, you know, we'll have to figure that out when we get there. Okay. And so this is kind of uh, where we're going next with these systems, right? We want to think about the equilibriums of coupled differential equations, right? And how those are different than an equilibrium in the one dimensional case where we only have one. Uh, differential equation, right? And so to do equilibria and, you know, find the stability of these equilibria, equilibria and sort of solve these systems around equilibrium points and kind of see where trajectories are going. And that'll kind of give us a good idea of what's happening in these systems from these very simple models, which are a lot more complicated than those one-dimensional models. Okay, so we're going to go into that this week.